Heoi, wives like you find in Plutarch, your stories of the saints that provoke readers to admire, desire, and imitate virtuous examples. I mean, in his own encomium, uh, his own praise of Aristotle, he, he says that uh, the, the comparison of outstanding teachers can be of great profit for sharpening and shaping one's prudent judgments. So Homer's, Dante's, and Plutarch's characters, sometimes virtuous and sometimes vicious, help us encounter in Zilstra's words a myriad of lives not our own. In C.S. Lewis's words, they help us see with other eyes and feel with other hearts. Now, this isn't moralism, but humanism properly understood, by which we become more humane through the stories of other humans. And if Melanchthon, Zilstra, Beekner, Lewis, MacDonald, Dante, and I haven't even started on Augustine, Review of St. Victor, if all of those guys are right, and who am I to argue with them, then the moral imagination, the morally tuned affections, and the building up of morally significant experiences are as important as cognitive moral deliberation for determining what we love, what we feel pleasure and pain towards, what we do, and how we live. This develops a literary version of Aristotle's claim that living in the company of good people can be an excellent training in virtue because, quote, friends take each other's imprint. A lovely phrase. In the Poetics, he writes that humans are what he calls mimetic animals who learn our earliest lessons through imitation. Oh, think of your own circle of friends from high school, from college, from your later adult life. Think about how they shape what you know, how you see the world, and what you love. I mean, parents, why are you so concerned about the circle of friends that your children have? Well, because you know that Aristotle is right. That friends take the imprint of one another. In his ethics, uh, Aristotle describes three types of friendships. Friendships of use, friendships of pleasure, and, and complete friendships. And at the core of complete friendships is the fact that friends push each other towards virtue towards moral character. And though Aristotle is thinking of flesh and blood friends, I want to contend that we should enlarge that circle of friends to include the virtuous historical or literary characters with whom we live in our imaginative memories. Right? Literary characters who literally become flesh and blood in our brains and live through us. Literary characters who in a way become incarnate in and through us. Now, my hope is that as you're sitting here, you've been reflecting on your own experience of reading and perhaps the significant literary figures or people that live in your own moral imaginations. <clears throat> perhaps you've done what I've done and wondered in any given situation how you might channel a particular character or historical figure. You're asking, you know, if, if I were Mr. Darcy, <laughs> what would Mr. Darcy do uh, in this moment? I used to teach creative writing for, for a number of years to high school students, and uh, my students would always create their own characters, and one thing we would do, uh, we would take their characters, and I would give them a bunch of situations they had to write their characters into. We always started with Hamlet, and we would say, because they all knew Hamlet, so I uh, taught that to them. And so we'd imagine Hamlet ordering at the hipster coffee bar. What's that look like for him? Or Hamlet getting fired from a job, or Hamlet getting pulled over by a police officer. And then we have them do that with their own characters so they can try to understand, okay, my characters have to be kind of fully orb living human beings. But I want to say that uh, that's the same thing we do when we read. Uh, but maybe some of you become so absorbed, uh, the, you've so absorbed the influence of characters that you're not aware of their abiding presence in your life. I mean, in my own reading, many characters have climbed out of the pages of the books, if you will, and taken up residence in my soul and act like a council of uh, wise advisors. Or they exist there as kind of embodied cautions against certain thoughts or, or actions. I mean, for me, these include um, Dostoevsky's Prince Mishkin from The Idiot, who taught me and teaches me about humility and sometimes the wise beauty of letting oneself be taken advantage of. There's the whiskey priest of Graham Greene's Power and the Glory, and Frederick Beekner's cantankerous Saint Godric, both of whom teach me that saints are sinners and that sinners can be saints. There's George Washington Carver and Langston Hughes, boyhood heroes from my hometown of Joplin, Missouri. There's Louis, the patriarch from Francois Mauriac's Viper's Tangle, who weaves this web of misinterpretation around him. There's Meg Murray from Wrinkle in Time, one of the most significant literary figures for me from when I was a boy. 
There's Oriwald from Till We Have Faces. Uh, there's Flannery O'Connor's O.E. Parker and Holman Joy, to be sure if you know those stories. And there's Dante, lost in his dark wood of error. And there are the voices of John Dunn and Gerard Manley Hopkins. But for my 17-year-old daughter, it's John Bunyan's Pilgrim, it's Samwise Gamgee, it's Joe March, and it's Joan of Arc. She's a fierce one, so those last two really relate to her. Um, but you only check your own circle, I think, of literary and historical counselors. And over lunch or over dinner, you can share with each other who they might be. But if this is right, right, if we do take the imprint of friends, literary or otherwise, then the question each of us might ask ourselves is, whose literary friendship should I acquire? <laughs> whose imprint does my soul need? Or if you're a teacher, whose friendship do my students need? Now let me add that every one of these books I just mentioned, except for The Idiot, was put in my hands by a teacher. Every single one of those who introduced me to these books and these characters and helped me read them aright. Now, in nearing my conclusion, let me name this type of reading. Of course, there are many reasons to read and many types of reading, right? There's a type of detached academic reading that seeks for science over savor. In the words of the poet Scott Cairns, there's reading for entertainment, emotional catharsis, aesthetic experience, cultural understanding. Is there's reading so you don't have to talk to the overly chatty person on the airplane on your flight from Philadelphia. Um, last November, I had a six and then a fifteen-hour flight coming back from Nairobi, Kenya, and you can be sure I had a small library of books with me, uh, depending on uh, who my my seatmates were uh, for that long flight. Uh, but the kind of reading I'm advocating here is uh, known in the medieval era as tropological reading. It's called tropological reading. Now, tropological comes from the Greek word tropan, which means to turn or to change. Or the noun trope, maybe you know that, meaning turn. So a tropological reading is a way of reading that turns into one's soul in order to turn one's life around or to turn it towards moral action. So classical educators would have understood this as reading in the musical or poetic mode, if you know that language. And it leads to what Melanchthon called humanitas, and what Hughes and Victor before him called pulchrum essay, or beautiful being. The point in a tropological reading is that the reading is not done, it's not complete when you reach the final page of the book. It's not complete when you're informed, convicted, or inspired. It's certainly not complete simply because you've analyzed the text in a critical fashion. Tropological reading is only complete when the reading reaches into your life, shapes the way you see yourself and other people, when it forms your moral dispositions and habits, and when it alters what you find painful and pleasurable and is embodied in prudent action. Now again, I don't want to overstate the case. It doesn't happen automatically just because you read religious texts, or novels, or epic poetry. If so, you'd expect biblical exegetes, English professors, and classicists, God bless them all, to be uniquely moral people. Despite their many admirable qualities, they're not necessarily. Instead, the reader has to adopt, and must be helped to adopt, a certain posture of humble receptivity and docile openness to the book, its characters, its actions, and probably do so within some sort of morally ordered framework of human flourishing. I mean, that said, it's also true, you probably know this, that certain books have the power to awaken us to that morally ordered framework for the very first time. And this happens when we spend time with books and allow its, their characters uh, to, to lodge within us. And we spend uh, weeks and months and sometimes years with these characters ruminating on them and their stories, like the crowd turning around Mount Purgatory, when we invite them to indwell us and thus turn us and help us develop the virtues and the prudence they have to offer. They gift us experiences that were not our own. In the Christian scripture, in, in Acts 15, the, the early church council in Jerusalem explains a particular decision they took in this way. They say it seemed good to us and to the Holy Spirit to do thus and thus. The way of reading I'm suggesting would be something like, it seemed good to me and Prince Mishkin, or good to me and Mr. Darcy, or good to me and Antigone, and so forth. It may also provoke us to recognize that some of our actions and emotions may be the kind that not only seem good to us, but also good to us and Raskolnikov, or good to us and good to me and Lady Macbeth, 
or Javert, or good to be in Paolo and Francesca, characters we would rather not resemble in our own lives. So tropological reading is to read with one eye on the text, one eye on a vision of flourishing humanity, and one eye peering into the window of our own souls. And yes, you mathematicians, three eyes. <laughs> As you know, that third eye was always the eye of wisdom, of foresight. The third eye is always the eye of prudent judgment, the eye Aristotle thought youth couldn't develop. Though the image predates Aristotle in Book 6 of the Ethics, he says we should heed the counsel of the elderly because having, quote, an eye sharpened by experience, they can, quote, see rightly. This is the kind of experience that literary characters and stories help us acquire by a shortcut, allowing literature, when read tropologically, to become the workshop of humanity. However, fair warning, I tell my students, you might not get budget to rent you a car just because you read Homer tropologically. <laughs> and the red light liquor store isn't going to sell you alcohol because you tell them Dante lives inside you. <laughs> but, but, you might overcome Aristotle's experience deficit. You might mitigate the delayed physiological development of your prefrontal cortex. And any of us might become lifelong friends with literary characters who give us more to be human with, and whose virtues we find imprinted on our own souls. And we might cultivate the third eye of wisdom and the virtues necessary to love the world and nurture our own flourishing humanity and the humanity of others. So let me encourage you to enlarge your circle of literary friends, because there are a host of fascinating people out there willing to hang out with you, willing to spend time with you, and as so many of you know, they're only a page turn away. So thank you. Thank you for letting me kick off your wonderful festival ideas. are already overbooked and we have had to set up extra chairs in the back, but um, yes. So hopefully you remember which talks you registered for. If not, really, not a worry, but um, now you have this time. Session one commences at 10.30. So grab a refreshment, take a moment, have a conversation about Dr. Williams' clarifying lecture. And so off you go. Enjoy the festival.